started it right out of the gate. And yeah. Eric's just a multimedia star yeah. at this multimedia point. Multimedia star. Yeah, <laughs> right. Multimedia so between so. radio and television and yeah, social media. Well, yeah. Yeah. That's because we can get stuff approved as an RIA. <laughs> Very <laughs> quickly. Mm -hmm. You'd never be able to do this. So. Yes, uh, welcome. So it's been a long time since we've seen red in the market and some volatility. And so it's great to be with you today. I'm Eric Brenner, president and CEO of Hilltop Well Solutions. And thanks for joining us. Uh, if you're a client, uh, I think you're going to get some really good information. If you're just watching this as a guest, we certainly are glad you are here. I'm joined today by a uh, partner in the firm, Beth Foley. So, Beth, thanks for joining us. It is my pleasure to be down here in South Bend in Mishawaka. Yeah, today. exactly. Mm -hmm. So, and we have a special guest today, Joe Mallon. Joe is uh, from Helios Quantitative Research. He's the Chief Investment Officer. And Joe has um, more than 10 years experience in the quantitative finance business. And we have partnered with Helios um, this year. And as many of you know, um, are using them as one of our partners really in helping us make really good decisions on our investment models. So we're going to cover today, we're going to talk a little bit about Helios and why we did it. We're going to get into the markets and we're certainly going to pick Joe's brain today and how he thinks about the markets and uh, we'll cover that. The other thing I want you to know is uh, we have some questions that have been sent in. You can send them in, put them in the comments section. So if you've got questions, Go ahead and type those in. Uh, we'll try to get to them. Um, you probably have some more questions now, certainly with some of the volatility choppiness that's happened here over the last few days. So with that, we're gonna jump right in. So, you know, we talk a lot about um, quantitative research, Joe, and why it's important and what's the strategy. So kind of in your view, you know, why is it important and why are we doing that? I just had a firm belief my whole career that Data shows making decisions based upon gut or feel or trying to project markets or stocks is kind of futile. It, no one's really proven to be great at it over time. But making quantitative based decisions on facts, data, has shown to rhyme with history, be somewhat repetitive. And I think if you can build processes that call it, say, are right 55, 60% of the time versus not doing anything, it could create a good repeatable process for your investment story, for your client's outcomes, and ultimately try to achieve their financial goals over time. That's what we're really trying to do. So putting a quantitative approach on investment decision making is just a smart way to really convey a good process to a client to help with risk management and ultimately achieve those goals they want. Yeah, that's great. So, you know, Beth, we, we, when we decided that we felt like there needed to be an upgrade, mm -hmm. you know, as a firm in the investment committee here at uh, Hilltop, you know, we went searching. We and did. We interviewed many different, it was a little bit like Goldilocks. This yeah. one did this, but that one did that, and that wasn't right. So we went through the process yeah. to find so, the company. Uh, maybe share with, with our viewers, you know, uh, why we landed with Helios to really be um, you know, kind of a chief investment officer in the office, so even though you're here today, but you know, to be there and help support us, which in turn helps support our clients. Yeah, um, I am happy to do that. So in, in, in my position, I think the one thing that struck me immediately, our first conversation with Helios, um, was within the first five or 10 minutes of the conversation about who they were and what they did, is they immediately started talking about the client experience. Um, they talked about clients' goals and clients' comfort level, and it was all about the clients, which is where we're starting from too. So for me, that was an incredibly important part of the conversation, and it has proven to be the case. Um, a second thought, you know, uh, of where we, how we got to this point of needing a change, twofold in my mind, um, was that last year, 2020, was complicated. It was hard. And for us in the investment committee meetings, and many of you guys will remember that we were doing the weekly, you know, live broadcast yeah. and so forth. And I don't know how many times, Eric, we said to one another, Wall Street is disconnected from Main Street. This shouldn't be happening. And Wall Street kept growing. And it was hard for us to make decisions of knowing which way to go. To what Joe just said, you can't really count on your gut. So we really needed to get some more data behind what 
we were doing and that's what Helios offered. And I find that with Helios, you know, we're looking at the data, it's math, it's not going on our gut. We have more information to make good decisions within the portfolio. And I really like that. The other thing, and this week on Monday, we're going to talk a little bit about Monday of, you know, this is the first kind of meltdown we've had since starting with Helios. And Joe, this is going to lead to a question for you. One of the questions that I get, Eric, I'm sure you get Matt and Bill and everybody from clients is, how often are you looking at my portfolio? You know, from the get-go, how often are you looking at my portfolio? With Helios, on a high level, we're actually looking at the portfolios once a week, mm -hmm. um, and then at a really deep dive with Helios once a month in the investment committee meetings. So a question, Joe, that I have for you is we're looking at all of this. We just had this big activity on Monday. Um, what, what could clients expect? How would their you know, investment management experience be different now with Helios and using you guys as our consultants than maybe what we would have done a year ago when we may have just been sitting and going, okay, we don't know what's yeah. going to happen. What should we do? Yeah. yeah, traditionally, Quant's only been available by outsourcing your client's money to a mutual fund mm -hmm. or a third-party asset manager. I think what we do uniquely is give you all of the tools and data to make the best experience for your clients because you know your clients better than we do. And my goal is not to really tell you what to do, but give you opinion and research to create the best path for your client. Because too often, if you're running a mutual fund or a third party account, your goal is just to win, beat the market, beat the market, beat the market. And that incorporates a bunch of risks that your clients may not want to take. Mm -hmm. We'd rather you create the best journey for them. So that's what we're, we're, we're doing. We're looking at data on a daily basis. Yeah. You don't want your financial advisor stop taking all day long in my opinion you guys are much better at planning knowing your clients knowing what they need from an insurance planning standpoint let us do the market research and convey changes when we think changes need to be made i like that and the due diligence behind it yeah um, do all of the research too. and the justification and mm -hmm. you know just give you con we use that word confidence all the time yeah. yeah we want to give you confidence that what you're doing is the right thing and educate you and your clients Mm -hmm. to have control and really understand what's going on in their portfolio. Yeah. 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 And, and I think one last thing on this, you know, I think, and, and I know you say this coming from, you know, sign of the institutional world is, you know, the institutional, the large funds, you know, these pension funds, insurance funds and so forth, you know, they do a really good job of basing decisions based on that data, right? Where the typical investor bases it on emotion. So we have just a lot of data, as you said, Beth, behind it, and Joe said, you know, which is just awesome that we can provide that. So, so I want to jump into the market now, okay? So I think everyone here is dying, okay? We got Joe here. It's like, okay, we saw some volatility. We had the whole thing with China, Joe. So kind of give us an idea here. What's going on? Where, where, what, where are we heading? Yeah, I mean, we've had a really good year. The, the markets were down in January, but all major equity indices have been positive since then month over month. And I think it's just this feeling that now that we're up over 20% year to date, what's going to happen next? What, how am I going to lose? And there was a little bit of a sell off last week, a little bit of choppiness, nothing too much, all normal. And then this news came out with Evergrande. Am I getting, I, I'm getting, and is that the canary in the coal mine? Meaning is it, it for those that don't know what it was, uh, a big real estate developer in China was about to default on their debt payment and people going wow what does this mean globally do we have too much systematic debt that these things are going to start happening around the globe yeah, and that, working back to the lehman brothers situation yeah, in 2008 that's perfect yeah at it's the like, time you're wait. like is this just an isolation uh -huh. or is this a and sign of bigger problems? and look what happened yeah. and so i think that was the fear that happened um on monday since then you know the the government has stepped in in china to help smooth the event over um we've actually rebounded significantly from that um, didn't really know that till this morning, that the markets are going to be back near where they were at the start of the week. So it's a setting now where I think people are a little bit jittery, where we've rallied so hard. Um, prices are expensive. But, you know, what are those fears that we see going forward? I don't see a ton. And that's why things like this start to really stand out mm -hmm. as potential sparks for a larger flight. I remember one, um, one of our meetings, you or Chris said, just because we've had significant corrections in the past and it's been so long since we had one, it doesn't mean that we're going to have another one now. And that's why we keep looking at the data and keep crunching the data week over week mm -hmm. rather than, all right, just because we've had it, it's bound to happen. Mm -hmm. 
it could, it will, it may, but it doesn't mean it's going to happen tomorrow because it, it's been, you know, eight months and three days since mm -hmm. it happened before. And that, that was the story leading up to 2020. We had the Great Recession in 2008 and 2009, and then it, this bull market kept going and going, and people are like, it's been five, six, well, 11 years. It's overdue. They're late. And it took a pandemic to actually yeah. make the markets correct, but they re rebounded so quickly. Right. So I think investor sentiment has fundamentally changed now from where it was in 2010 and 11. Because that, to me, that was a, uh, from an investment standpoint, from a, a retirement fear standpoint, far more scary for clients. The 2020 recession was so short-lived mm -hmm. that I think that sentiment's almost more in people's mind that any sell-off we do have should rebound quickly. For right, for wrong, I don't think that accurate, but I think that's a little bit more of the sentiment going on right now. Uh, Joe, Joe um, one of the questions that we get a lot, and, and actually I have a question here about uh, inflation. Yeah. I'm sure you hear that a lot. I know Beth and I have talked about it. So concerns about inflation, kind of what do you think about inflation and how to process that? Yeah, so traditionally you think of inflation as this long-term measure of increase in price. And 2020 threw everything off. And we know why prices dropped. And I, we know why they've rebounded so high. So right now, the CPI or consumer price index is about 5.2% year over year, which is incredibly high. But it's all excused because we're looking back 12 months to the depths of the recession. The, pla the plan and the expectation now is this term transitory, that we aren't at 5.2 to stay. We are going to get back to that low 2% level, which the Federal Reserve and the government and the markets really like by end of 2022. So if that expectation plays out, I think we're okay. And that's really what the Fed has continued to convey to everyone, that their, their expectation is to be in these 5% numbers for maybe another quarter or two, but then we'll creep down over the next few quarters. So late 2022, we'll, back, we'll be back in a more normal range of, all, or of inflation. Do you think there are any triggers that might prevent that from happening to transition downward? Are there any triggers that might keep us where we're at and kind of stall that process? Yeah, there's there. One, one strange thing has happened over the past several months where when you look at these expectations of inflation, they, they survey the top economists across the globe. And those numbers I mentioned to you is kind of the midpoint or the average of what people are expecting. But the extremes now have widened. So there's people out there saying that we could be at five for the next two, three years, some as low as down to one. Yeah. And that creates a little bit of uneasiness for me because it doesn't mean that we're gonna follow this path perfectly. Yeah. So there are scenarios where we could stay up in the high five range. And I think, um, you know, just cost of goods, continued supply chain disruptions. Um, you know, we've seen things like lumber and iron come down significantly. Um, but if food prices stay high, gas could stay high, it could really cause inflation to stay at a higher level, which would not be a good scenario. Yeah, well, I really like that you provide, you know, to us that if any of the clients out there want to look at it, that, that kind of research on that, um, uh, it's been very interesting yeah. that we can provide, month over provide month, to sure. it. Mm -hmm. So, you know, um, another thing I think about, and you mentioned a little bit with the supply chain. So it's it's been very interesting that you know companies have been able to stay profitable even with the unemployment the way it is and can't find people and uh, the supply I mean you go to, into some stores and shelves are empty in certain areas um, uh, you know are the models showing anything right now and how that's gonna affect somewhere down the road yeah we, we tend to look at like total output retail sales those are still pretty strong but there is this aura that I think we all feel and you go to your local grocery store, you go to your local clothing store, and it, business owners, I'm sure you have clients that are business owners that are dealing with it very directly, mm -hmm. that even though the macroeconomic data isn't pointing to a lot of concerns, I think it can cause some issues as we go forward. And the, the, to me, the big number is really the employment data. We're still 5 million jobs short of where we were pre-pandemic. Mm -hmm. And until people can really build up their staff and their labor to help the, the whole economic system flow smoothly, I think we'll continue to see um, you know, supply chain issues. 
from what I've read and what I see, a lot of the supply chain issue has to do with people. You know, businesses having to close down to quarantine folks, people not coming back to work, um, and so forth. That the supply chain comes down to uh, transportation. You know, getting people driving trucks and you know unloading cargo ships and things like that. I wonder if. Um, going way off the, the, the topic for a second is do you think that the shortages that we're seeing in truck drivers and transportation could spur um, accelerated movement more toward autonomous trucking, autonomous training? Could this be an uh, unintended consequence mm -hmm. of, of, because that's a growing industry anyway, mm -hmm. and could the supply chain situation and getting you know something from point A to point B, could that lead to more growth and development in that particular industry? Yeah. Accelerated growth. Absolutely. I, I, I think that was already a trend, like you, you said, but why not? You know, Why not prepare and accelerate investment in those areas to help protect your business and not be reliant upon a labor, well, labor force. Time. Yeah, and a, a little micro example of that is just our experiences with clients over the past year and using something like Zoom. Mm -hmm. You know, that's cut down on gas and driving and the amount of wear you put on a car and- Time, time, time. my day. It's I don't have to make everything. that commute. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah. Um, so I want to remind uh, everyone, if you uh, want to ask a question, you can put it in the comment section. We have a couple that's come in here. I'm kind of monitoring them, so please do so. Uh, and Beth and I have had some other questions um, that we wanted to ask. So, um, so we talked a little bit about this kind of, you know, we, this volatility that we've had, Joe. And, you know, uh, some of the press has said it's going to be choppier. It's going to be some more volatility. Are we starting to see some of that in our our modeling? Yeah, I, I think that that statement is kind of a good level setting because what we've experienced over the past years has have been anything but normal. Yeah. And this type of movement in the market is rare. And to see positive returns in 2020 and then be up again 20% in 2021 seems insane yeah. if you told somebody we'd go through a global pandemic and a recession. Yeah. So I think that's just smart level setting that markets go up and down. Yeah. And this week was a good example. We did not sell off that much, but people are, is this it? And when you start getting texts from friends that don't even really follow the market of, do I need to sell everything now? And you, you just need to say, relax. You know, markets tend to be volatile over time. If you're a long-term investor and if you're in the right plan and the right mix of assets, you're pretty insulated to any short-term choppiness in the market. But it's our job to really kind of squash those fears and if they are real fears, do something about it if necessary. But this week to me was just normal choppiness, reacting to some news, counteracting that news, and you know we can draw out some scenarios that could create more chop, um, but where we sit right now, I, I think expecting that for the rest of the year is pretty baseline. Um, so um, another thing I think about is, um, interest rates, you know, and uh, we've pretty much, you know, uh, communicate with clients that we've been waiting a long time now, you know, for interest rates. And uh, it's been a long time since interest rates were even at four or five percent, you know, and get it in the bank or the money market yeah. account. So, um, y you know, and, and I think the view is, I mean, we're just in that environment. It's, there's probably not, I mean, and, and maybe with that, Joe commenting on uh, Chairman Powell mm -hmm. and, uh, hey, this is a good week. You came here with choppiness in the market and Chairman Powell speaking, right? <laughs> yeah, exactly. So, um, you know, maybe combination, how, how are we thinking about that? Yes, I think the, I'll touch on the Paul, Powell question. So he came out yesterday and said, in the market, really liked it was they're going to begin tapering here at the end of 2021 and then sometime in mid 2022 we could expect interest rates to rise so where we sit now is the the federal reserve has pegged interest rates near zero they don't have a lot of ammunition there to to help fix any sort of economic issues so and they're also purchasing a lot of in an open market transaction purchasing a lot of bonds this helps keep interest rates low as well. They're going to take the foot off the gas pedal a little bit, and that's the concept of tapering. doesn't mean they're going to stop buying bonds. They're just going to decelerate the amount they're buying every single month. 
And that, that is a known fact. They need to do it. I think their messaging has been pretty good. And I think that strategy coincides really with what we're seeing in the economy right now. And the market seems to like it. So if the path plays out, um, I think we can expect kind of a smooth increase in rates. And it's something that needs to happen because if we run into another economic crisis, the Fed needs dry powder. They need ammunition. They need something to be able to tackle it. And where we're sitting right now, there isn't a lot of flexibility to do and it. Some of that, again, trending and, and heading in that direction, is that some of the logic behind within the, the models that we're using is shortening the, the, the length of bonds, the term of bonds within mm -hmm. the portfolio mm -hmm. as uh, counteracting that potential increase in interest rates and, and bond prices? Does that all tie in together? Absolutely. So when we think about just managing fixed income in, in client accounts or, or models, it's really looking at how much interest rate risk we want to take and how much credit risk we want to take. Because it's not a, a, an easy story to say, I think rates are going to go up from here back to 5% over the next two decades. That's a pretty baseline assumption. You can't just be fearful and not take on any risk. So we try to manage how we do that risk over time. And right now we are seeing high inflation numbers. We're seeing odds are of rates going up instead of down. And in that scenario, we don't want to have a lot of long dated bonds, we want shorter dated bonds, more conservative until that opportunity exists again to go longer duration or own longer dated bonds. So, I mean, then it's obviously can't predict it, but probably phase in over time a little bit, but it's still going to be a while mm -hmm. for interest rates, right? For those trying to just, you know, have money and savings and things like that. So we, we have other strategies that might be better. So it's certainly at least work, worth looking at. Looking at it, exactly. So <laughs> here's a question that came in. Um, well, I'm sure you get this a lot. So how will the markets and economy be impacted if the in infrastructure bill uh, making their way through Congress, right? There was some pretty big news, mm -hmm. right? Seems like they're moving along. Of course, we never really count on it until, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, you know, so. You know, the 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 markets have already baked that in. Is mm -hmm. the are the markets breaking in the potential for big yeah. infrastructure spending? I believe so. I mean, markets are always projecting. They they don't react. I mean, buy the rumor, sell the news is a, a common saying because owning and buying stocks or assets, it's all about what they're going to do in the future. Mm -hmm. And when you look historically, it, questions like this come up all the time, and it's often a very politically motivated question. Okay. Is it not? It, and our job is to really focus on the data and the investment side of it. And I think with this infrastructure package, you have two conflicting growth stories. One is just 3.5 trillion of investing in anything is stimulative to the market. You know, the government spending money in the market makes asset prices go up. The concern is how do you counteract that from a budget standpoint? And that is with increased taxes, which hurts growth in the market. So, you know, politically, do I know, think it's the right move or not? You know, I can't really comment on that. But overall, I think it's a stimulative measure and it, it should help the stock market, um, regardless of what they do on the tax side. It, it should, it's not going to be a bad thing. Could the bill come due later in terms of U.S. debt rating? Mm -hmm. This, we haven't touched on it, but the, the um, debt ceiling. All, all of these things come as a knock-on effect of that, but in isolation, I think the infrastructure bill is very positive for the stock market. And you know, as a side note, that I think is important for you know uh, everyone to know. And you know, as this comes about and tax law changes and so forth, and Beth, myself, and the entire team continue to educate ourselves and and pay attention as we get closer to it. So more to come there. More to come. I think a lot to come over the next handful of years with regard to taxes and the the Jobs um, Act in 2017 and what that does to the sunset provision in 2025 and of yeah. 2025 all kinds more yeah. coming yeah more come tbd yeah i don't, I don't that's yeah don't yeah. you guys because <laughs> you got that's your expertise but yeah. trying to navigate through taxes and things like that is super important for clients and you guys get the hard part yeah yeah yeah, yeah. so here's a good question so um they're all good questions but um are you concerned about how challenging it is for employers to find new hires and if so how will it affect the market that's a really good tie-in. I think everywhere you go, mm -hmm. I mean, I, I know I've never seen it this. A lot of clients say they've never seen it this way. It's um, so remarkable about 
about, you know, up in Detroit, I can't tell you, even just like restaurants and bars, I'm sure it's the same here. So many businesses keep shortening their hours and shortening hours um, because yeah. they just don't have the staffing. Yeah. And what does that do for business growth over time if you just can't stay yeah. open for business? Yeah, so you and your team, how do we put that, how's that looking for the market? Yeah, it's kind of that jobs issue of having that five million job shortfall and the unemployment claims came out today at 351,000, which was more than expected. So more people are claiming unemployment. And it's multifaceted. It, it, it's the you know, added incentive not to go back to work. I think we have, still COVID's a very looming concern. And I think um, you know, it, it, depending on what happens with school, people need to stay home, take yeah. care of their children. And not taking on a job that you can't fully commit to is probably concerning. Um, we have a couple of issues that are bigger than that that were before COVID, and that is we have a shortage of, you know, technical labor in this country. And we typically have grown that labor force through immigration, and that's seized up a little bit now with COVID as well. So it's really, it's multifaceted. I don't think it's going to figure itself out quickly. I think expectation is that once COVID is far more managed, um, that it will get back to a more normal scenario. But I think we've learned over this past year that it wasn't a up and down concept and we're gonna be back to normal. I think we're gonna be into the end of next year before you really see that figured out. No. Um, well, that's very interesting, yeah, because it, it is definitely, it is an issue. Mm -hmm. So um, the, here's, a, here's a question and um, so can Helios offer an opinion on what sectors or industries might provide the best growth potential? Ah, they're looking for the, the hot, <laughs> good one. The hot tip, the hot right? Tip. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, but, but I know that's not database decision, but you know, um, how you approach that. Yeah. It's a great question because, you know, being a quant and an academic, I've tested every way you can to try to time sectors from a quant perspective you know, looking at underlying commodity prices and moves in interest rate. It's a very difficult thing to do. That being said, there are some ways in which you can quantify sectors to be in. And right now we do like, and it, it's almost always a question of a give and take. Because if the question I think asks is what's the most opportunistic, I think that continues to be tech, for some of the reasons we talked about, and continues to be consumer discretionary, just because people are still going, as the economy recovers, they're going to go out and buy so more and more. In this moment in time. In this moment in time. Consumer discretionary. Yep. Um, as people Correct. return to. I reserve my right to change my answer in you know 30 <laughs> days, but that's just how it works. Uh -huh. But to that question, I'd say those two. But so I'm helping the economy if I go out and buy myself a new kayak. There you go. There. Just buy some consumer discretionary stocks before you do it. Yeah. <laughs> That's, that's very interesting. Um, so another question is, um, uh, Bitcoin. Oh, thank you for bringing that up. <laughs> yeah. So I know you get that all the time. And, you know, I heard the other day, you know, from uh, it's a whole scam and it's, you know, not going to be there to it's there. And, um, you know, I think the investment world's trying to process it, right? The question comes up. So often, I, every, at least once a week, Beth, what should I do? How do we add into the portfolio? And it's a non-regulated situation, so I'm still, I gotta stay away from that. But yeah. what do you think? I, I have my, my personal opinion and then the answer I should say, but I'll give, I'll give you a glimpse of both. Okay. Um, if I'm an advisor and somebody poses this question to me, it's why are you buying it and why do you want it? Because if, it, if it's because you've heard of people getting really rich, you've seen it go like this and you want in on it, that's the absolute wrong reason to buy it. If there is a fundamental belief, you know what it is as a client and why you want to own it for the long term, go ahead, dabble in it. But you have to understand it is an unregulated asset. There are things that could happen where the hammer could come on down on it hard and make the value go to near zero. So that's kind of the... the fair answer and how I would handle it with a client. So you don't want to just say no, you know, it's stupid because your opinion might be wrong. It could continue to go up and up and up and you look, you look bad. So um, my personal opinion on it is things like this, once you lose, once you run out of people to buy it is when the party stops. Oh, that's and yeah, that's once, you know, now this, this concept has started to trickle all the way through every individual you probably know. Mm -hmm. People's grandparents are asking about it. And when it hits there, who's going to be left to buy these assets? And 
I don't see it ever being touted really as a, a change in currency or a disruptive tech. I, I see that, but the reason it's being sold is based upon historical returns. Mm -hmm. And that's why most people are buying it. And if that concept goes away, I think you're going to run out of buyers and it could be a bad idea. Even with companies like Goldman Sachs um, who have developed their own cryptocurrency, you know, it does feel like it's going more and more into the mainstream. Mm -hmm. You know, my kind of personal answer to the question is I think that it will be part of our future in some way or another, but it may just be that we're, you know, dealing with digital currencies rather than as we do already by carrying around American Express and Visa MasterCard mm -hmm. as opposed to dollar bills and coins mm -hmm. within the portfolio, that it's going to be part of our world in the future yeah. in some way. I think the technology behind all of that is is paramount and it is going to change the just transaction type technology that we have. But the asset behind it, I don't know if I'm a long term believer, evidenced by anyone can come up with a new asset and run it to a high valuation doesn't seem like a very to be offered there. But yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. So, Joe, um, you know, as you think about, you know, from 10 years ago to today um, and for clients out there that are investors, you know, what what do you or kind of a couple of highlights that people should just take into mind and consider? Um, you know, one of them is certainly the direction that we're taking from simple modeling, mm -hmm. right, to uh, quantitative research modeling, right, um, um, uh, institutional approach. But are there a couple other things that you would really encourage people, you know, 10 years ago is different because t than today because? Mm -hmm. That's a great question. I think the one that comes up the most is what to do about bonds, right? And I think this is probably a question for a lot of your clients in the retirement phase and you know, 10, 15 years ago, taking no risk gave you a four or 5% return. Right now, that's above zero. Mm -hmm. And my, my, my comment on that is one, there is no free lunch in investing. If you're getting that five or 6%, it's not without risk mm -hmm. and it needs to happen. Um, I think the other concept is this fear that if rates do go up, that it's really going to hurt me as a retired investor. And I want to kind of dispel that a little bit because I think rising rates could be uh, a good environment for retirees because they're going to earn more income in the future. You may take a little bit of a hit on the mark to market or the value of that bond, but you're going to get higher level of income as we go forward. So that's kind of my first you know, thing I would say to it. Don't forget about it. Yeah. Like, and don't look at it just because stocks are up 20%, your bond portfolio is flat, that I got to get out of this and I got to get into stocks. Remember that it's an important piece of an overall portfolio. Mm -hmm. It's there for a reason. It's different than stocks. Let stocks give you your growth. Let bonds be your kind of stable base. And don't be fearful of rising rates with your bonds. I think it's going to be a good thing in the long term. Um, and just maintaining your appropriate risk in the market. Stick to your guns and don't be fearful of fixed income. That's my number one question I get right now. That's great. Right. Thanks for that. Beth, you got any uh, closing questions for, as we want to wrap this up? Um, uh, we've covered a lot of good topics today. Um, I, I feel like we've hit a lot of the questions, and, and I don't know if this is a good closing question or not. Um, you used the phrase a moment ago, and um, I heard you use the phrase earlier this week in our Tuesday call. Um, Talk to us about this concept of keeping your powder dry. Um, you, you used it this week. I, I believe it was you who talked in, in the sense of, um, or maybe it was in, in the, um, some training that we did, um, with contrarian investing. Mm -hmm. And then you just used the phrase again with, with bonds in a sense of keeping your powder dry. Mm -hmm. um, can you maybe just you know, tell us a little bit about what you mean by that um, for folks who might not know? Yeah, having some dry powder just means looking for that opportunity to invest. And I feel like a lot of folks may have that mentality now where what's the next Tesla? What's the next? The, there aren't really any screaming options like that now. There was in March of 2020 yeah. when everything got really cheap. Mm -hmm. So we run a, a, a quantitative process called contrarian mm -hmm. where we look at the valuation in the market. And when that's really elevated, we want to make sure we have some dry powder to have the ability when that buying opportunity comes to get in and buy it. Mm -hmm. Over the long term, it's not an incredibly successful strategy because markets tend to go up over time. Yeah. So if you're not playing, you're not making that return. But now might be an interesting time to think about a little bit of dry powder mm -hmm. just for that next dip 
to be able to have something to put in to work because if you don't have any of that dry powder where are you going to get it from so and in our portfolios we do keep a level of cash in each one of the portfolios so that there's some dry powder there that may not specifically be um, earmarked for that purpose but is there in the event that you know a client did want to take advantage of that yeah and the great thing about you know partnering with helios is we're working and you've got some other models built that uh, could even take a little bit more man, uh, uh, advantage of the dry powder mm -hmm. and um, so we'll be talking to, to clients along the way here as to what those are as well um, so I think that that's that's all great. Well, Joe, thanks so much for being here in person. Yeah. Um, you know, not on a Zoom or something. It's great to have you in the office. And Beth, thanks for being down here for the day as well. And I want to thank all of you. So if you're a client, we certainly appreciate you as a client and uh, allowing us to guide you along your financial journey. A couple things I want to just uh, bring up. One is um, you're going to want to continue to watch the website. We're we're planning on. Uh, having more workshops as we go into 2022. Um, certainly with tax law changes, uh, markets and so forth, there's gonna be topics to talk about. So we certainly wanna um, make sure you uh, take advantage of that. And then the second thing is that we have a retirement decision guide. So if you're interested, um, you can go to fortheclimb.org, fortheclimb.org and get your free retirement decision guide. You could also call the office or talk to one of your advisors uh, and we would be glad to get you one of those guides as well. So with that, I'm gonna close it out. I uh, appreciate everybody taking the time today and we'll see you all soon. Thanks so much. That was some good, very good information.